Uh, I'm going to be talking today about PCG, which is the procedural content generation framework uh, tools that we have inside Unreal Engine 5. So they're in 5.2. Uh, so if you haven't tried them out yet, urge you to. Quick show of hands, actually, who has used the PCG tools in 5.2? We've got a few few eager people. You're in preview as well, so I hope none of you are working in your final projects for that. It's just experimental. Um, okay, cool. And uh, have any of you seen the talk that I did uh, at GDC? It was just posted on our YouTube channel, just so I have kind of like a vague idea of how much content I'm going to be retreading here. Okay, so yeah, my uh, video team, uh, they worked a little bit too quickly for my liking. I was hoping that I would be able to just do the same talk again, uh, but seeing as it's been posted online already, uh, I'm going to be doing some new stuff uh, instead. So we'll, we'll do a little bit of retreading for those of you who've already seen the talk before. Um, the rest of the time, we're going to just be doing some new stuff. So hopefully, uh, there's some good content for everyone here. So uh, to give you an overview of what PCG does, I've got a nice big open two kilometer by two kilometer landscape inside my world. It's set up with world partition uh, and there's not really anything else in there. Uh, we have a bunch of volumes inside of our level here. So this one is my rock demo. I can go over, I press the generate button and then it will go through and it will run through and generate the entire thing, right? So the entire two kilometer landscape, it goes and generates all of my lovely rock data and cliff assets. Uh, this is actually only one rock because uh, I didn't have time to do any more. So uh, we just threw it in there multiple times. Uh, and I can do that again, right? So I can go in, I've got a forest demo as well. I can press generate, let that run. I'm going to run out of video memory because I'm doing this on my laptop rather than the computer I got to use at GDC, which is, uh, which is nice. Uh, but you can kind of see here, it's kind of just running through and generating. Um, one of the really nice things about this tool set is that it just works out of the box with world partition. So if you've got a world partition level, all of the instances that we generate here get placed into a, a appropriately sized cell volume that it will then put those instances into. So it will all work with, uh, with world partition. And once that's been generated, we get all of this lovely uh, you know, kind of asset data that gets kind of placed into our scene here. So we can kind of start building up and designing and prototyping our level really, really quickly. Um, and the entire premise of this is built off a graph system. So if we open up one of our graphs, you can have a look at it here. So again, really nice and simplistic, very similar to all of the node-based work that you'll have seen inside the editor already. Uh, and if you see some of these, we are planning on releasing the Opal demo that we did for GDC as well, which is that lovely forest scene. There's going to be some very, very scary looking PCG graphs in there, right? So I just want to break this stuff down for you nice and quickly so that when you go and look through that demo, when we eventually release it, it doesn't look as terrifying uh, as all that, right? So the basic premise is we have our input. This is where we define what data we're going to take in, whether that's going to be the landscape, whether it's going to be a volume or a spline or texture data or whatever. We can define that input here. Um, we actually have multiple ways of inputting in data. So if we expand out this tab, we have kind of an in and input actor. We actually have landscape and landscape height, which you can just grab by default. Um, and basically the way that the in tab works is that it will, it will grab whatever is defined as the default input type, uh, either on the PCG actor itself in the scene or just from the parent that it's attached to. So if you have a spline that you've generated in your level and you attach a PCG component onto that, it will just pull in that spline data for you. Uh, so once we've taken in that data, we sample it. So we have surface samplers here, which we're using to kind of sample the, the landscape data. Uh, and then once we have that data, we filter it, modify it, tweak it, get it to kind of like look the way that we want it to. And then we output an end result, which in this instance is just going to be static meshes. So uh, I'm going to kind of deviate for now from the original talk. Uh, I've got some extra examples that I've set up just inside our content example scene uh, to kind of just take you through. So the starting off with some nice super basic stuff, um, we have just a simple, uh, a simple graph that just spawns some meshes. Uh, so if we go in and open up the graph, we start off with our surface sampler, which is just going to take in those points. Uh, and one of the really nice things about this, which I love, is the, is the debug option. So if you press D on any of these nodes, it'll actually represent what you've 
built uh, inside this scene uh, inside the editor so that you can actually see the output of that. Um, this is really nice because again, when we're working at this level, we haven't defined an output. These points don't exist in any other like means except for like graph data, right? So we don't actually have anything visual to show. So we apply a debug option for all of those options. Those are in the bottom right, which you can kind of see here. And we get like a nice static mesh that you can choose and you can pick a different material. One of the things you'll notice as well is that these points are uh, color coded. So they have a random grayscale value assigned to them between zero and one. This is what's called the density value. And we basically use this arbitrary de uh, density value to modify and tweak those values over time. We can reset it and change it as much as we want. So we've generated some points with our surface sampler node. We've got some ways of changing how we generate that data. We've got points per square meter, points extents, and looseness. Um, so looseness is basically a assigns a, a random kind of position offset, but it also offsets the distance between all those points as well. So we don't get any overlap, even when we're kind of like randomizing position. Our point extents let us set the size of the actual asset it's, uh, of, the, of the object. And then points per square meter is just kind of like the arbitrary density value that gets assigned to that. Uh, interestingly, points per square, uh, points extents um, is actually assigning a volume, right? So when we're talking about points, uh, and I can show it here if we have a look at our attributes. Uh, so if we go down and debug, this is where we get to see lovely, lovely graph data, which is where at the procedural conference, I'm sure all of you are very eager to start digging into that. Um, so we have our position, our rotation, our scale, but we also have bounds, right, as well. And that's because each of these points is a representation of space uh, not just like a point in space, but actually like a volume of space. Uh, so we have that, we have color, we have density, we have steepness. Uh, and then if we sampled anything else, so if we'd sampled the landscape when we started this, we'd actually get all the weight data as well for that landscape so that we could uh, filter based on that. So we've generated some points, right? Uh, but we want to have them snap to the landscape uh, or snap to the ground. Uh, now, if we'd got the landscape data when we did that surface sample, it actually would just automatically put it down. But because we're working with meshes, uh, or in this case, a, a blueprint created environment, we need to do what's called a projection. So the projection lets us uh, basically project the data back down. We can choose our target for that. Uh, so if I just switch my debug option here, I'll just move that over to the side. You can now see that those cubes have been flattened downwards. And we've got that from our world hit query. So we can query our world with a ray, uh, with a ray hit. We can choose what type of trace we do into that as well. Uh, so with our um, advanced options, we can choose what type of collision channel we actually use to, uh, to do that, whether it's static, dynamic, or a pawn, or, or whatever. Uh, and then that gets kind of applied to it. Uh, we can also pick, you know, kind of the direction that that, will, that ray hit is going in as well. Uh, and then we can apply a transform. So the transform's really nice because it allows you to set some random variation between all of those points. So in this instance, I'm kind of setting the scale and the rotation, applying some random variation to that. And then once we have those points, we output our final static mesh. I don't need to debug that because we can actually see uh, the output. And this is letting us assign our mesh entries. So on to the next one. We've got some other examples here. This is kind of some of the newer stuff. Uh, so we can also do exclusions and differences between uh, our points that we've generated. This is incredibly handy for being able to avoid overlap, right? Which is a really common thing that you'll see in a lot of procedural tech. Uh, when you're generating it, um, you'll see kind of like trees spawning in rocks, spawning in puddles, that kind of thing, right? So in order to avoid that, um, we can use those bounds that we talked about earlier and difference between the two. So we can take a two point data, uh, pieces of point data, difference between the two of them, and then we can use that to filter out the assets that are there. So in this one, I have uh, an example of a large shape which again is these nice Unreal logos, keeping on brand. Uh, and then we also have the smaller sample as well, which we're generating um, on the top layer here. So we've got just two surface samples. We project those both down. We do a transform just to vary that scale and those bounds a little bit more. And then we do a simple difference between the two so that we can kind of exclude anything. And that way we don't get anything spawning inside our larger shapes here. 
so you can kind of see it's there's nothing in there. The next one is uh, is the way that you sample assets. So you can actually sample mesh data uh, as well. Um, so if we take a look at this volume, we've got our mesh sample. I can open this up. So uh, here we take a, a node called mesh to points. And what this will do is it will take in uh, a predefined mesh. So in this instance, I'm using the torus. Uh, and then it will, it will sample points in that. So if I press D again to debug, this is one of the interesting things as well about working in the editor. Uh, our debug values are actually going to be at 0, 0, 0. So I'm going to have to go all the way over here <laughs> to go and find them because they're in local space, right? So they're not actually uh, you know, kind of assigned to a particular position. But I can use this to, to kind of basically scan the mesh and sample the mesh and then generate a bunch of point data uh, on that asset. Once I've done that, I can filter it a bit more. So um, I've got the mesh, but I only want the points that are facing upwards on the normal. So that lets me kind of like filter out the top. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to do a donut demo uh, on, on this one. Uh, and then once we've done that, we can apply a simple density filter as well, which is just going to reduce down the overall points that we have in our scene. Now, once we've got that data, we want to use it in our, in our world, right? So uh, what we can do is we can then, I've got these toruses that I've generated already. I can actually just copy the points onto those. So I've created kind of like a cluster of point data, which is from that torus. And then I've just used copy points. So it takes in the source, which is going to be our cluster. And then it takes our target, which is going to be all of the points that we've already generated in our, uh, in our world. And then once we've got that, we can apply another density noise, we can filter it back out again, uh, and then we can choose what mesh we want to render on it. So in this one, because um, it's the content examples map, I've chosen some fish to put into that, uh, onto that asset, right? Um, so we can use that data to write really nicely gather uh, information about the asset that we're working with and then filter it and add more information on top of it. Um, so this was used in the forest demo quite heavily where we sampled rocks and rock data, got the normals of it and then used it to scatter either hanging vines or reeds underneath the surface or spawn foliage on top uh, of that surface as well. And then the last one I just want to show quickly, and then we'll do a bit of Q&A uh, if we've got time, um, is just the spline sampling. So this one's really nice. So I've got a little uh, example of it here. Uh, there's actually multiple ways of sampling uh, your spline data. So if you open it up, we have our spline sample here. Now, by default, you'll be able to do it on distance uh, or subdivision on the spline. So you can basically either choose to divide along the entire length of the spline, which will give you kind of even increments, or you can just choose to do set distances uh, along the spline. But what you can also do as well is that you can choose to do it in the dimension of the spline, which gives you access to the basically the outer scale and the horizontal or vertical axis of the spline, which means that you can do really cool stuff like this, where you're sampling along the entire length. Uh, so if I go in, Get my scale value to come up. No, it's not doing it. There it is. That's fine. Scale. We can kind of drag it in and out. I've gone way too far. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. Regenerate. No, anyway. Um, so then we can also apply that on uh, actors with our meshes as well. So if we have our spline data, we can sample within the volume of that asset. So again, I've got another copy here, uh, and we can open up that graph, open it up. And we take the spline sample again, and we can then add additional transforms on top of that, right? So if we get those base points that we are using on our spline, we can then use that to spawn whatever meshes on top of that as well. Now, I'm only using it for static meshes here, but you can spawn anything you want, right? So you can use a spawn actor instead of static mesh, and that will let you spawn blueprints, which can in turn spawn more stuff, or you can use it to spawn particle systems, audio, um, absolutely anything. At the end of the day, this is kind of just an arbitrary point system that 
holds attributes, and then you can assign and build your own attributes and systems within that. Um, it's really, really exciting. Uh, we're already seeing some absolutely amazing stuff being done with it, especially because this tool isn't just an editor-only tool, it's a game tool as well. So you could take that landscape that I showed earlier, and you could ship the entire thing completely empty, and then you can generate it all when the player loads. And then partway through the game, you could have a massive event happen. You could wipe all the data and regenerate it again with new parameters and have the entire thing reload. We saw a really cool demo actually uh, from the, uh, the PCG team actually did where they did kind of like a capture the flag-esque mode. But each of the zones that you were capturing within that would generate a new PCG data based on who captured it uh, and then regenerated the entire thing. So you got really dynamic level changes and stuff like that. So this is absolutely amazing stuff that you can do with this tool. Um, and yeah, we're looking forward to seeing what people do with it. Um, thank you very much for listening.